Building a metal 3D printer can be challenging. Now this probably goes without saying, but I think it deserves some emphasis. For it's been a while, but today, finally, we see the end of printing metal tracks. Now there's been quite a bit of work over the last couple of months, but I want to keep things brief and focus on the issues ahead of us. So let's blitz over it. So I drilled some holes, slapped a couple of these on top, attached some of these, bunged this thing on, and then threw this thing on for good measure. I made this thing which sounds like this. I ruined my power drill. I applied some metal glue and patched everything together. And finally got everything set up. Now there are a couple of other things that needed work before I could move on. Obviously I had to repair the laser after I had damaged it as per the last video. This wasn't too difficult and I'll make reference to the tutorial I followed here but getting the correct components and adhesive proved a little more difficult than I would have hoped. I specifically wanted ferrules with the correct sizings as the original termination was open-ended and didn't guarantee that the output would be concentric. As for the adhesive, it's not common and fairly expensive stuff at that. I paid around 55 USD for this delivered. You can buy it in smaller quantities for about a tenth the price but I had bought this locally in hopes of getting it sooner rather than later. Unfortunately I could only find a single supplier near to me which had the adhesive listed. I ordered it online, they back ordered it, the courier lost it, and what should have taken a week turned into a month. So while that was unfolding I decided to tackle something else that needed attention. The recoding system on this has been a case of iterative design, i.e. recognising my mistakes and fixing them. Starting with a simple drop bar, and then a pair of planter blades coupled with a single drive motor, followed by two motors, and then two larger motors. And for the most part this was adequate. It did its job but it was slow, and did a better job of spreading powder backwards due to an imbalance in loading. Where it really suffered was when it encountered metal that had risen above its intended layer height. With everything now in place, the next step was to reassemble the Ricota. And like in many previous instances, this quickly became a swearing match. I'd originally designed this while the printer didn't rely on an enclosure, but it was evident that it was time to tear things down and start again. This time I designed the assembly so it wouldn't need to be tensioned from underneath, and it would rely on a more rigid design to prevent issues with each motor keeping sync, and allow for an interchangeable Ricota blade should it need to be cleaned or replaced. I also wanted to improve the recoating time and prevent jamming from occurring due to protrusions. I started off using a square section of nitrile rubber, initially unsanded. This worked pretty well at slower speeds, but as the speed increased it proved to be better at wiping, taking part of the coating with it. I tried sanding the blade so that it was level and adding chamfered edges, but I think the surface area was still too large to be effective. I also tried a couple of variations of this, but ultimately this was failing due to compressive loading. What I really needed was something that was flexible and could cleave the powder without any force applied, and later I came to the realisation that I may have had the answer in my hands this whole time. So I ended up cleaning up the edges of a plastic swipe card and making a new mount to support it, leaving a 6mm clearance so that if the blade were to catch on any metal protrusions, it should just flex without jamming. This will need some adjustment to ensure that it doesn't disrupt the surrounding powder too much if it does catch, but at least in theory it won't crash an entire run. With that out of the way, it was now time to get the laser set up properly. I wanted to test for any preventable failures and figure out a better method for focusing the beam. I started by powering the unit up to close to maximum power with only the raw fibre mounted to an adapter, letting it run for 10 to 12 minutes. It turned out the SMA905 connector hosted within the adapter was too long, so I cut it down, ran it again, and confirmed it ran cool. I also noticed the current output was limited at 13 amps, despite being set to 15.5. It turned out the leads had a voltage drop of 0.5 volts across them, and this was capping performance. I ended up switching over to an external reference and raising the voltage by about 0.2 volts, which saw the supply reach the set current. I then tested the setup with a collimator mounted, because I was trying to focus close to 180 watts over a space of 12 to 13 millimeters, I found that it was difficult to find a heatsink that would absorb the energy without reflecting a large degree of light or wouldn't simply burn. Because of this I decided to reduce the power, testing it at 8 amps, and it came as no surprise that later on this would come back to bite me. Transitioning to a gantry with a fixed height has brought about some new challenges when it comes to focusing. In the past I could get away with roughly focusing the beam, following it with a sweeping pass to find the correct offset for the focusing lens. Now that the powder bed was no longer floating, this was no longer an option, but to its advantage, at least for now, there was no window to interfere with the effective focal length, meaning that I could make a fixture to mount to the lens assembly, adjusting the lens height and also ensuring the gantry was parallel to the bed. Since the effective focal length sits somewhere between the two lenses, I simply used the image created by a light source and cast it against a wall, measuring the distance between the two. It's not difficult to calculate the back focal length for an arrangement like this, but I prefer to measure things where I can. In the last video I stated the fibre was destroyed by my mishandling, allowing dust to get onto the end of it. That might still be the case, but upon reflection, I now happen to think it might have been just that. I had mounted the output perpendicular to the substrate, but have now added an offset of 3.6 degrees. 
I've since tested the laser against the manufacturer's spec. It should rise by about 13 watts per amp, but now appears to be limited to around 12, making for an expensive lesson. So, it was now time to pick up where I left off, trying to find a balance between speed and power and improve consistency. After going through the usual routine, I set up a run to print three tracks, keeping the speed and power approximately the same as the last run before I ended up toasting the fibre. What you can see here, starting from the top, are three tracks printed at 5, 10 and 15 millimetres a second at 8.5 amps. Originally, the laser was set to 8 amps, but I had added half an amp to correct for the losses due to damage. Also, I have to apologise about some of these shots, I need to get my hands on a decent camera with a macro lens. So you can see the first track is fairly rough, has the largest spatter and the broadest path cleared in the powder. The latter two tracks have better outlines, have better profiles, less spatter, but aren't that much better overall. You can see the amount of powder removed is slightly less and the paths cut are slightly straighter with the latter two tracks, but notably show signs of overheating. At this stage I was under the impression that this was the result of both too slow a speed and too low a power, so I decided to do another run at 11.5 amps across a broader range of speeds. You can see the improvement in the comparison to the last set of tracks, and the contrast between 25 and 70 millimetres a second. At 70 millimetres a second, we are much closer to striking a balance between speed and power, resulting in a consistent profile with less powder being drawn into the melt pool. You can see the charring and the spatter that arose from too great a heat exposure at 25 millimetres per second, improving with each pass. The track widths are all fairly much the same at 300 microns, which is on par with the calculated spot size. The most pronounced difference between the tracks is their respective heights, with the slowest pass measuring approximately 240 microns, and the fastest pass measuring 150 microns, highlighting the impact of unfocused heat. For the next run I kept the power the same and decided to up the speed, just to see how far I could push things, this time covering 70 to 100 millimeters per second, as well as testing the hatch spacing, set to 0.1 millimeters across four tracks. Unfortunately the acceleration was limited to 500 millimeters per second squared, and I wouldn't realize this until later. You might have noticed the nodes at the end of each track, with the exception of the first track, and this is in part due to the acceleration, but I'll touch on this later. With the four track runs you can see there is a broader amount of material removal in the direction the laser is moving, along with more spatter and charring. The spatter and charring are obviously the result of residual heat, but it's the spacing between the powder and the final track that I want to focus on. If we note the size of the flame produced by the initial pass, and then compare it to any one of the following three passes, we can see they are significantly smaller. I presume this is due to the laser not directly impacting the powder, instead, it is only the surface tension responsible for consolidating the additional molten material. This results in the overall track developing a raised edge where the first pass occurs, and each subsequent track helping to build a fillet. I had encountered this issue before as seen in this image here, where I had performed a bounding box first, resulting in a raised edge, particularly as additional layers of powder were added. I think the most effective strategy against this is to increase the speed by as much as possible, so less time is spent heating the surrounding powder, but I wanted to experiment with a different strategy and attempt to gain better control over the mount pool geometry. Generally, for 316 stainless steel that is free of impurities, the surface tension gradient is said to be negative, meaning that the convection currents within the mount pool rise up towards the hottest point and flow outward from there. With sulfur concentrations as low as 30 to 60 ppm, this gradient can be inverted and result in an inverse flow. Since I'm bound to conduction mode, my ambitions are surface level, aiming to avoid imbalanced geometries by avoiding rising currents. Before approaching this, I had my current powder tested via XRF for sulfur content, returning a negligible result of 1.3 ppm. Not all commercial grades of 316 powder have high concentrations of sulfur, as it is generally said to weaken the metal, the upper bound being 300 ppm. Since I didn't want to blow at least a couple hundred dollars on what may prove to be an idle curiosity, I decided to mix raw sulfur with my current powder. It has to be said, this is crude, and trying to obtain even concentrations using this method, particularly with a relatively coarse grain size, is impossible. So to try and mitigate this, I increased the concentration to 3000 ppm and took the raw grindings and passed them through a folded 190 micron mesh. I should also mention at this point that I've been baking the powder, just to ensure there are no issues with moisture contamination. Then there is also the obligatory mention that this is dangerous. If the gasket is to break, then I'm likely to have a fire on my hands. On that note, the gasket is only temporary as I've found some wideband protection windows for little money. Not that I plan to keep using sulfur in this manner. As for the results, you can definitely see the effect of the sulfur reacting in the presence of what should be less than 0.1% oxygen. You can also see the irregularities in the tracks by what I assume is turbulent flow within the melt pool, most likely caused by excessive sulfur content and poor distribution. As for the intended goal to help round the profile of the metal tracks, it does appear to have worked, although not without compromise. As it's difficult to illustrate the effect, and since I had some discrepancies in the track height that I was sceptical of, I set up another run, this time covering half the substrate with pure powder, and the other half with powder containing sulphur. You can see the ridge that runs along the top of the closest track on the side marked NS, and the concave fillet that follows from it. This is the imbalance I've been trying to control, caused by the differing levels of powder availability between the first and subsequent tracks. 
You can see the side with sulfur doesn't suffer this issue, but is quite messy, which is understandable but undesirable. So at the moment I don't think I can draw any hard conclusions from this, other than I'll have to get some proper high sulfur content powder and test this out once again. Getting back to the issue of droplet formation at the ends of the tracks, raising the acceleration to 15k solved the issues at the tail end, but the start of any pass was suffering from inconsistent triggering. Because I was literally switching the power supply on and off due to issues mentioned in the previous video, this meant that the front end of the supply was discharging, creating a variable delay. I've been meaning to switch over to digital control, varying the current rather than switching the unit on and off, but I had forgotten to order the UART to RS-232 bridge that I needed. So in the meantime, I'm relying on an Arduino acting as a comparator, triggering on the analog reference of the power supply unit. Since the printer could now produce repeatable results in one dimension, I wanted to move on to two. So I set up a run with the intention of testing various hatch spacings from 0.05mm to 0.15mm. But as I alluded to earlier in the video, my streak was about to end. Unfortunately the plastic container which was supporting the gantry wasn't up to the task. In hindsight, this is pretty obvious, but since I hadn't envisaged being able to move the head this quickly, I hadn't really planned for it. At least fixing the issue isn't overly difficult. As for the next issue, well you can see it unfolding now. Reflection from the lenses and potentially the print led to the ASA material smouldering, hazing the lens and fibre. I was quite lucky as it didn't destroy the end of the fibre, and I think I'll be able to get away with only polishing it. As for how I will fix this issue, I'll need to make the lens holder from aluminium and potentially invest in an isolator. You can see the beginning of the print shows potential, but as it will take a bit of work to rectify these problems, I'm going to end the video here. I want to say thanks to those who've shown support, and particularly those who have donated, as that helps with ongoing costs. In the next video I'm going to be setting up closed loop control for the Z-axis, amongst other things. Anyway, thanks for watching.